Welcome all. The UNESCO Brussels South Office is at the European Parliament today following the presentation of the World Water Development Report hosted yesterday by the European Parliament Water Group. In light of this presentation, we are joined today by two guests to further discuss this issue. Ms. Miriam Dalli, Member of the European Parliament within the Social and Democrats Group and Vice Chair of the European Parliament Water Group and Professor Dr. Stefan Hulenbroek, coordinator of the United Nations World Water Assessment Programme. Allow me to briefly introduce today's discussions. In 2015, the international community adopted the, 2000, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Universal, inclusive and indivisible, the targets of the Agenda call for action by all countries to improve the lives of people everywhere. Within this framework, SDG 6, Clean Water and Sanitation, aims at ensuring the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Furthermore, it is important to underline that the achievement of a large number of SDGs depends on the access to safe and sufficient water. As such, the United Nations World Water Development Report is a flagship report on water. It is a comprehensive review of the state use and management of the world's water resources and aims to provide decision makers with tools to formulate and implement sustainable water policies. The report is coordinated by the United Nations World Water Assessment Programme, which is hosted and led by UNESCO. The 2018 World Water Development Report was launched at the 8th World Water Forum in Brasilia on World Water Day on the 22nd of March. This forum is the world's biggest water-related event organized by the World Water Council every three years. And this year, more than 100,000 participants attended the event in Brasilia. The latest report covers the, trop the topic of nature-based solutions for water. In other words, how natural processes contribute to the, improvement, to the improved management of water. Mr. Hulbrook, nature-based solutions for water are central to achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Could you please explain what nature-based solutions are and provide us insight from the latest report? Yeah, well, thank you very much and thanks for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to explain that a little bit. Well, I, I think nature-based solutions can be summarized as any solution to address water, water management challenges that use nature. You know, it could either, either be uh, uh, preserving, protecting existing natural systems, you know, the natural functionings of the, of the ecosystems that help to achieve water management objectives, or it could be an engineered, uh, an artificial natural system, but still uses natural systems. So it's kind of pro, in a proactive way, we manage water through natural systems. You know? that can be used to either enhance the water uh, access or water availability. We need, we need to store water. Now, the classical thing is to, to build the dam, for instance, and to store surface water. But on the other hand, there might be also natural solutions that can help to store water in the underground, in the soil, in the vegetation sometimes. Uh, you know, so there's different solutions to that. And other things about um, increasing the water availability is maybe one thing. The other things are increasing the water quality. Water quality is a big challenge, also in many European countries and worldwide, that's what we show in this report. And uh, natural systems or nature-based solutions can help to improve the water quality. They can help to clean wastewater. They can help to, uh, you know, to, to discharge water to the environment in, in acceptable quality with uh, not compromising the health of ecosystem and the health of people. And maybe the third water management objective that can be addressed with nature-based solutions is um, reducing risks. We, we know that there's a, quite a number of uh, water-related risks. It's, it's, you know, it's either too dirty, that's the water quality part, but it can also be too much or too little. You know, too much means flooding, so we need to store water in the landscape. Or we need uh, nature-based solutions to enhance the, the, uh, the base flow, you know, the dry weather flow, so that we have more sustained uh, discharge to the environment, so in, in uh, reducing the impact of droughts is, is another thing where nature-based solutions can be very effective. And always, I don't want to over-advocate here, you know, nature-based solutions are not a panacea, they have a great potential, but on the other hand, nature-based solutions uh, should either substitute, but also augment or work in parallel with other grey infrastructure solutions. And depending on the objective that we want to achieve, it could be that the, the, 
nature-based solution is the way to go, or gray infrastructure can also be needed. So it's all about the, the, the best blend of solutions to solve a local problem. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lee, you are the Vice Chair of the European Parliament Water Group, an informal forum that aims at increasing the level of awareness for water sustainability in the EU and placing the need for a more sustainable and innovative management of the EU's water resources on the European political agenda. The European Parliament Water Group plays a key role in making sure that Europe's water resources are managed in a sustainable and equitable way to the benefit of the European economy and the society as a well. whole. Taking this into consideration, Ms. Dalli, how does the Water Group contribute to shaping future EU's pol water policies? I would like to start with a point you mentioned, which is of particular um, interest to me, um, when you said that nature-based solutions uh, can be complementary to also other solutions. And I think that is the approach that we need to take, because uh, you're asking me what the European Parliament Water Group is doing or the main agendas that we're trying to push. Um, I would like to classify them under two main areas. First and foremost, pushing water as a priority because many times I get the feeling that water might not be as attractive as other um, topics mm -hmm. for people to discuss further. Um, so you get a lot of people speaking about transport, for example, about energy, but maybe less about water. When really and truly we need to understand that water is an extremely valuable resource. And this leads me to the second um, part of what we are trying to do. Um, we would like people to really understand that value, that water, sorry, has a value and that we need to attach value to water. It is not a resource that you find without any um, work that is needed behind. Um, it is not an unlimited resource. It is something that we need to take care of. It is something precious and it is something um, that we need to make sure that we create as much as possible. So I like this approach of nature-based solutions. At the same time, we need to push forward also um, gray and green um, solutions because I think that both of them together can help us have a situation where we will have um, sustainable water production, um, proper water quality, and making sure that we address the issue of uh, sanitation and also making sure that people um, across the EU, but also across the globe, have access to quality water. This is a very interesting point, and Professor Ulberg, delving deeper into nature-based solutions, can they be adopted by all countries or a specific level of development, as for example, engineering or organization is required? No, nature-based solutions can, can work everywhere. So it's not uh, an industrialized uh, country topic, so not at all. Um, you know, and, I, and I would like to pick on, on the point that uh, Madame Dali just made very well, and uh, the value of water, which is very critical. And I think nature-based solutions are they're multifunctional. At the one hand, they maybe address different water management objectives at the same time. So they, they store water, like in a constructed wetland, but also enhances the water quality. And they have other uh, co-benefits, you know, and that increases the value. For instance, a, a constructed wetland could, could be uh, for recreational services. It could be uh, useful for um, creating jobs because natural wetlands, you know, first you have to construct them and then they need to be managed. Organic mass is produced, a bio, you know, biofuel can be produced on a, a constructed wetland or timber for construction job creation, socioeconomic benefits, it enhances the water quality, so therefore reduces the health risks to it. So, so there's a number of other uh, benefits that come with nature-based solutions that are usually not, not proper quantified. They're also very difficult to quantify. Therefore, uh, comprehensive economic models need, need to be set up to do that. And then it can, be, it can work everywhere. And I feel in particular in, in regions of the world where the development status is not so high, nature-based solution offer offer solutions that can be very cost effective, particularly cost effective when you consider all the co-benefits. So it's not only a question of uh, uh, storing the water to pretend, pr uh, protect from flooding, but it's also the co-benefits that has to that have to come into that equation. And, and then it could be uh, the, the tipping point to actually uh, see that with the available resources, um, it's a better investment to, to invest in a, a nature-based solution or in a blend of gray and green infrastructure, whatever is the best under the local circumstances. Huh? But really, it can work everywhere. 
And so, is it feasible to adapt natural-based solutions, for example, to developing countries? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, absolutely. I feel, particularly in developing countries, where the need for infrastructure is tremendous, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, they do not replace the necessary investments in infrastructure, but they rather augment or you know substitute and uh, work in parallel. Therefore, it's absolutely a solution also for developing countries and the. Um, the, the, the positive side effects, what I called co-benefits before, uh, in terms of job creation and uh, socioeconomic benefits, health and uh, uh, increasing biodiversity, capturing, uh, storing carbon, et cetera, et cetera, are these you know, uh, very applicable also to the developing world. Yes. And so how can we accelerate the uptake of natural-based solutions? Oh, uh, well, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> what, what is it, the multi-million dollar question. Yeah. Um, I, I would think that it needs investments, but um, also great infrastructure needs investments. So it's not that the, the, um, it's easy. But on the other hand, uh, using the existing resources already and be open to the whole suite of solutions and then find the best applicable solution for a local problem, including nature-based solutions, is uh, maybe the first step. The second is, uh, I mentioned before that the, the co-benefits are, are quite uh, significant in, the, uh, in relation to nature-based solutions. And these co-benefits need to be properly quantified. Mm -hmm. um, it has been shown that, for instance, investments in, in water supply and sanitation have a, have a multiplier of five if you include all the um, wider benefits for society. People are healthy, can go to school and to work, and et cetera, et cetera. So the same is true for nature-based solutions. There's also a multiplier that, that varies a lot in space and time. But, but to quantify that probably is, a, is another key point uh, that, that can tip the decision towards a, a more green investment compared to a gray investment. And maybe the last point I want to make, and, and uh, Madame Dali will, will explain how complicated that is, but uh, I think it needs the right regu uh, regulatory framework. You know, It needs a legislation that allows us to do so. And I, I feel, thanks to the successes of uh, the, the, the members of Parliament Water Group and, and many other players, uh, in Europe we have already a legislation that allows us to do so, not only in Europe, also in other countries. In our report we discuss um, examples from Peru, for instance, where they explicitly mention nature-based solutions as, as a solution to address their problems. Yeah? But, but that legislation needs to be developed and needs to be uh, um, enforced, also that it works in practice. Is it complicated? So it's not easy, but I would take just the last word you mentioned, enforce, because I believe that um, even the best legislations written well as they may be, if they are not properly enforced, then we have um, real, real issues in the particular member states or in the places where such legislations um, are rolled out. But our role um, as European Parliament is to make sure that we have such legislations in place. Uh, for example, at this point in time, in front of the Environment Committee, we're dealing with two particular pieces of legislation um, related directly with water. One is the um, Water Framework Directive and the other one is about the reuse of water. Um, so one is about the reuse of water and the other one is about the um, drinking water. Mm -hmm. um, and these are extremely important uh, legislations that we are dealing with. I feel many times that when we trigger policy, people and citizens get more engaged into the topic. And I'm saying this because in the European Parliament, just a few years ago, in this legislation um, and in this mandate, we had the European Citizens Initiative, Right to Water. Um, it came in front of the Environment Committee as well, where we were pushing for water to be considered a common good and also a human right. And this is one area where you see that policy triggers citizens' awareness and citizens' awareness in the other um, turn, they trigger policy decisions. So it is like you have this chain reaction where one thing um, moves the other. There is another area which, in my view, the European Union is working hard on, but it would require also global initiatives. And here I'm speaking about the quality of our seawater, because mm -hmm. ultimately um, we need to focus also on seawater, um, we have countries that depend on reverse osmosis, that depend on desalination projects. Um, I'm speaking from experience, my country is one of those countries as well, um, where geographical capacity is limited, where you need to find solutions which work also for the specificities um, of that country. But we need to ensure um, and make sure that the sea 
um, water quality is one which ensures that ultimately we take care of our seas, but make sure as well that when such um, marine water is used for these desalination projects, it actually um, gives the proper um, quality that is needed. I'm kind of interested and intrigued also by the individual projects that are happening in the different member states. Mm -hmm. Because it's true that we have EU-wide policies, but there are a lot of initiatives happening in the individual member states, which show that um, awareness is increasing on the value of water. So when you see projects about the reuse of water, when you see projects about new water, about how these are used for agricultural purposes, um, about how these are used also in tourism establishments and the like, you start realizing that there is this increased awareness amongst our citizens and amongst our authorities that we need to make sure that we give a proper value to water and make sure that we do not treat this resource as though it is an unlimited resource. Whereas we need to make sure that we use more than once the water um, the technology is there. Um, I think many times the major obstacle is the mentality or the behavior until people actually get used to the idea that yes, that water is high quality water and it can provide for the services and for our needs. So, um Obstacles and achievements. What have been the major achievements in the EU in terms of water development and uh, the, what are the major obstacles to overcome in the near future? I would say achievements and obstacles go hand in hand because ultimately if you don't have a challenge, you don't have um, the need to trigger a policy. So the moment you have an obstacle, the moment you have a challenge, then the need comes to um, actually have a policy to address that challenge or to address mm -hmm. that obstacle. I think if I had to look at the European Union and understanding that there is a legislation in place, that we have the legislative framework that is making sure that we address um, uh, the quality of water, that we address access to water um, across the whole of the European Union, bearing in mind that we have different countries, they have different geographical situations, they have different economical situations, but we need to make sure that water is a human right and people Sorry. need to have yes. access to um, good water, um, good yes. quality water, because ultimately here we are dealing also with people's health. Um, yes. When you have countries where people do not have access to quality water, you will have situations which can um, lead to fatalities, even run-of-the-mill illnesses such as diarrhea, for example, which can lead to fatalities, um, eye infection, yes. infections which can lead to blindness. So there is this direct link. It is a health issue. I agree it is an economic issue because if we find new ways and means on how to we um, come up with solutions that can help us produce new water, then there are job opportunities as well and it is an environment issue. I think the moment we start looking at environmental um, topics from this perspective and not in a vacuum as though they are an environment issue alone, it is the moment we start getting people more engaged because ultimately any environment issue that we deal with has much more impacts and has much more consequences than just the environmental ones. Yes, exactly, because the sustainable management of Europe and globally, huh, water resources, it is indeed essential to ensure quality of life, uh, as you just stated, a green circular economy and also environmental protection. In light of this, with 90% of the global economy activity dependent on water, the sustainable and innovative management of this resource is key to our future. And Europe has one of the longest track records in water management and it has one of the most ambitious and challenging water legisla legislation in the world, as you just introduced. As a pioneer in water management, does the EU need to take even stronger responsibility in terms of acting as a role model when it comes to sustainability and water management? The European Union um, prides itself in being a leader when it comes, for example, to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I would like to link water to climate change as well, because the two um, areas are directly linked. Because what we're seeing also when it comes to climate change is the desertification of certain areas, is the lack um, of water resources, lack of access to water in parts um, of our world. And that leads also to displacement of people from one area to another. And this is an an argument that I would like to emphasize a lot because climate change is not something that is happening far away from us. It is um, something that is making people move from one area to the other. I've heard about situations where um, you have countries where because of climate change, even their groundwater tables are being um, sal with salination because of um, the climate change and the differences it's, it's making. Water is becoming unpredictable also in many areas of the world and that is leading to even refugees moving from one place to another and many times i many times i know that there are people who are um, pushing away the concept of climate refugees but the moment we stop dealing with climate change in a serious manner, the moment we stop dealing and addressing the um, lack of water resources is the moment that we will have more of a high and pertinent issue when it comes to migration because of climate, when it comes yes. to climate refugees as well. You spoke about ambitious legislation. Sometimes certain people are a bit afraid of what they term ambitious legislation, when really and truly we need to be ambitious to make yes. sure that we are future-proof, that we um, have the proper defences before um, any situations which can be disastrous actually strike. So I would like to see the European Union acting before being too late, rather than having to deal with the consequences which then would be um, too massive or too big to deal with. So I prefer legislation which is preventive rather than have a um, disaster strike and then trying to deal with that. Mr. Hulmluk, I would like to close by asking you a last question. I don't know if you would like to add something to it. Well, I, I couldn't agree more and I'm very happy to hear that, that this sustainability thinking and, and the critical importance of to deal with climate change now, you know, in a mm -hmm. preventive adaptive preparedness type of uh, philosophy is I'm very pleased to hear that yeah right so every year at the high level forum political forum composed by united nations member states the 2030 agenda and the selection of its sdgs are reviewed in 2018 this year sdg 6 on clean water and sanitation is one of the goals that is going to be reviewed the SDG report, the SDG 6 report has just been released. What is its aim? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and this year, what is on the agenda of the high level political forum, as you said, and uh, to inform that process, um, we have decided from, from the UN family, it's a UN water report. Uh, we have decided instead of you know, producing many reports, uh, you know, one per agency and holding that up and, and giving that to the attention of the policy makers and say, well, please listen to us and look at our policy recommendations to, to avoid that, that fragmentation in terms of reporting, we decided to, to have one major so-called synthesis report where we synthesize where are we with SDG 6, with water and sanitation globally, you know, how water is actually connected to all the other goals, food security, climate change, uh, terrestrial ecosystems, people, health, gender, etc. And also, what are the key policy recommendations that, 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 that we have that we would like to share? So that synthesis report we have just um, released, it's on the, on the web now, mm -hmm. and it will be official, it's uh, layouted at the moment and, and officially launched in, in June. Uh, we introduced it to the member states in New York two weeks ago, early May, and uh, based on the initiative of Finland and Lebanon, we had a session with the permanent representations where we presented the main findings of that report. So the main objective of the report is to inform the political process, assessing where are we with SDG 6 and what are the key policy messages um, that, that we would like to share to, to prepare ministerial declarations in, in the right direction, put it like this, you know, that's the main objective. And uh, we have some, some 17 or so key findings. You have to invite me maybe for another interview at the box <laughs> box to explain all of them. But, but, I, but I think a, a couple of highlights, if I may. Uh, the SDG indicators, are often, they're all new when it comes to water. So we often don't have a long time series. But for some, you know, related indicators like the number of people having access to basic water, having access to uh, basic sanitation, there we have a time series. 
And for all, one message is true. It's time to act now. It's time to act for climate change and it's also time to act uh, to achieve the water goal. Otherwise, we will not achieve un uh, universal access to safely managed drinking water. We will not achieve universal access to safely managed sanitation. We will not end open defecation. 12% of the global population still defecate in the open because they don't have any access to a toilet. Yeah? We will not achieve IWRM, integrated water resources management, across all levels, including the transboundary. Currently, some 59% of the transboundary rivers and um, groundwater basins have a operational agreement, but if you see the, the number of years that is needed to set up such an agreement with, in, in many transboundary situations, the situation is quite tense when it comes to water. So it, we have to speed up, you know, we really have to re-emphasize um, how important water is, we have to re-prioritize prioritize that uh, globally and really put more emphasis on achieving SDG 6. Yeah? I think that that's one of the, the key messages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Professor Hulbrook. Thank you all. My pleasure, thank you. Thanks.